Romans 4, verses 17b to 20a. He, Abraham, is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Against all hope, Abraham, in the hope, believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Roman Paul gives us three things that tell us what faith is. First, he says, the key to, is the object of faith. Next, he shows us the obstacles to faith. And then he tells us the objectives of faith, where faith will bring us. Abraham, Paul says, believed God. God is the object. The quality of your faith depends upon the object in which that faith has placed its trust. The amount of faith you have has nothing to do with it. That is why Jesus told us that even if we have a little tiny faith, like a grain of a mustard seed, it will work. The object of your faith is the important thing. This is why we shouldn't be talking about our faith. Instead, talk about the God in whom we have our faith and whom our faith is fixed. That's what Abraham looked at. It's not a question of how little or how big your faith is. It's a question of how big your God is. What kind of God is he? There are two things about this God that helped Abraham tremendously. First, he is the God who gives life to the dead. The God who makes dead things live, who takes things that were once alive, vibrant and full of life, but have died and become hopeless and brings them to life again. And second, he is the God who calls things that are not as though they were. He calls into existence the things that do not exist. He is a creative God. In the book of Genesis, it is recorded that God said, let there be, and there was. Over and over for a week, God said, let there be, and there was. Until after six days, he rested. And that is the kind of God that Abraham had. The God who gave life to the dead and who called into existence things that did not exist. It was that God in whom he fixed his faith. Now, let's look at the obstacles to faith. Whenever you have faith or a call to exercise faith, there are obstacles and there can be horrendous obstacles. And here are two that Abraham faced. First, there were hopeless circumstances. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. But it also says in verse 20, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. That is, the promise itself was the second obstacle to faith because it had such staggering possibilities. It was too good to be true. It was beyond belief that God would make him heir of all the world and give him a standing before God that he didn't deserve. This too good to be true became an obstacle. Now, isn't that interesting? These two obstacle faiths, obstacles to faith, hopeless circumstance and staggering possibilities. And let's see what Abraham did with them. What were the hopeless circumstances Abraham faced? And Paul tells us there were two, Abraham's body and Sarah's womb. Abraham's body was 100 years old and in terms of fertility, dead. The promise of God hung on the fact that there must be a child born to Abraham and Sarah. Through that child would come all the descendants from the nations of the world that would be blessed. And more important yet, through that child would come the seed, which was Jesus Christ, whom Abraham saw and rejoiced in and would make possible the gift of righteousness. And everything hung on the birth of this baby. Abraham looked at the circumstances and saw his hundred year old body and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. She was 90 years old and had never had a baby. They'd been trying for years and years and no baby had come. And these were the hopeless circumstances. And it's in this that we find the beauty of Abraham's faith. Paul says that he faced the facts. I love that. In this translation, it says that without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact. 
Many of us think that faith is evading the facts, escapism, some kind of dreamy idealism that never looks at facts, a kind of unrealistic adventuring in which you hope that everything is going to work out. And it is never that. Abraham looked at the facts. He faced them head on. He considered his dead body in the barrenness of Sarah's womb. He sat and thought about it and he saw how hopeless the situation was and there was no chance at all. It was hopeless. There was no hope and yet Abraham believed in hope. How? Because when he looked at his dead body, he remembered that he had a God who raises the dead. And when he thought about Sarah's barren womb, he remembered that he had a God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. That would take care of everything, wouldn't it? And so against all hope, he believed in hope because of the God in whom his faith was fixed. There is the faith of Abraham. So how did he deal with these staggering possibilities? It's unbelievable that all the nations should be blessed through them and he would be heir of the world. He would be called the friend of God. And could that be? And again, Abraham remembered that he had a God who gives life to the dead and a God who calls into existence things that do not exist and so believed. So going back to our third point, in verses 20 to 22, you'll find the objectives of faith. The first is in verse 20. But he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. His faith was made strong. Faith grows. And Jesus said it would. If you have faith like a tiny little grain of a mustard seed and the object of your faith is trustworthy and is promised to do something, then you exercise your faith and it will grow. Obey. Abraham did. And as he believed and obeyed, he was strengthened in his faith and he gave glory to God. Faith never glorifies man, it glorifies God. It is God who acts, not us. What is accomplished is not something we do on behalf of God. It is God on his own. It is God who does it by us and through us, on his own behalf. God, therefore, is thanked and God is glorified. So faith grows and faith glorifies. In verse 21, Paul says, Abraham also was fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. That is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Faith grounds us on the truth, as it did Abraham. He was fully persuaded. This is the faith that was credited to him as righteousness. And faith grasps that promise. Faith lays hold of what God has offered. And as Abraham's faith grew he grasped the promise and found himself loved and accepted by God and as a friend of God. And finally, I'd like to just look at the last two verses in this chapter. This is not part of the three points that we just went over about what faith is, but it's about the beneficiaries of faith. And I think it's really critical and important. So the words it was credited to him were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death from, for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Isn't that interesting? This happened 2,000 years before Paul, but Paul says God did not write those words for Abraham alone. For whom, they were, for whom were they written then? Well, for us. For today, we look at the faith of Abraham and say, wow, that was extraordinary faith. But Paul says it wasn't. It was ordinary faith. Anyone can exercise such faith if they want to. You can have righteousness too. You can be a friend of God, accepted before him with worth and value in his sight. Not just once as you begin your Christian life, but every day, taking it fresh from his hand. You are forgiven of your sins, restored every day afresh and anew, a thousand times a day if you need it. All that Abraham had, the promises, the indwelling of the Spirit, all are ours as well. This verse says the gift of righteousness is for those who believe in him and raise Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
He is still the God of resurrection, the God who can raise us from the dead. He was delivered over death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. So we live by his death and by his life. And now if we believe in a God who raised Jesus from the dead and we are ready to live on the basis of his death and his life for us, we, like Abraham, are heirs to, of all the world. All these things are yours, Paul says. The indwelling of the Spirit is granted to us moment by moment and day by day, all our life long. And we, like Abraham, are the friends of God. <laughs>